Yes. Sorry about that, John. Um, keep kicking on. So when you coached North, you coached under Peter Louis, didn't you? He was the uh, head coach yep. at the time. Yeah, so, Peter Louis. Where, where did you get the urge from to coach in the first place? Like, was that just you enjoyed your playing experience, want to give something back to the game in general? And I was coaching, you know, school boys at uh, at school. Being a school teacher, I was, you know, coaching the the kids, and uh, you know, I liked uh, helping the younger blokes at Parramatta with their, uh, you know, with their skills and 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 giving them advice on how they could improve their skills. So it was a natural transition being a PE teacher uh, to coaching. And, and Peter always said I was a captain and I didn't get much first grade time in the, the last two years I was at Parramatta, but I was captain of reserve grade and Peter and I had a good relationship. And uh, he always told me if he got a first grade coaching job that he'd call me to, uh, to, to help him out and, uh, you know that's that's exactly what happened. He got the um, he got the job at North Sydney after winning some premierships, reserve grade premierships there, and then he uh, he he gave me the call, and I was more than happy to do it. So it was part time as well as as coaching. I was I was um, teaching as, as well, so it was, it was back to the the old same sort of uh, as playing, but um, yeah. a little extra work were in front of the TV and tape recorder in those days. So you had a fair level of success with the North side too. You had guys come through at the time. Jason Taylor, when he came across the place, was already first grade, but you would have had going through your reserve grade side, guys like Chris Caruana and Mark Soden would have probably been coming through around about the same time, maybe just in the first grade and then um, David Fairlay is probably coming through around about no, the same time. Yeah, all those blokes were uh, were already you know grade players before I got there. Matty, Matty Sears was in my twenty threes. Um, yeah, um, he came in as the Australian schoolboy uh, five eight, and uh, you know in discussions with Peter, I thought he was a better uh, better fullback. Uh, his cover defence was second to none, and he's ability to get the ball quickly and, and get back upfield and, and be elusive, you know, to me, screamed uh, that he was a better fullback, um, even though he wasn't as tall as a lot of them. Um, you know, so he was really the one that, that stood out uh, in my time, my time there that, uh, that I had early on. Um, so, yeah, all those other blokes were... were you know, been there a couple of years. In fact, Fairley and those, uh, Mark Soden and that, were in the reserve grade side that beat us in the grand final, beat Parramatta in the grand final in 89, which uh, they never let me forget. <laughs> yeah, I thought it would have been. Was Paul Conlon still kicking around then or is he in first grade as well? Uh, Conno was there for, for the first year I was there, but he, he had a bit of an injury. But, um, you know, he came into the coaching coaching staff uh, as soon as he retired uh, which was which was good he, he was a good bloke and and um, you know he he eventually you know was was there for a, for a couple of years which was good good then you know get old players uh, from the club and keep that tradition going and and he was certainly one of the ones who um, transformed pretty well kissy Les kiss uh, mark Graham also so um, you know they they were coming coaches uh, when I was, you know, Peter's assistant rather than being reserve grade coach or under 20, 21 coach. Yeah. So how, after you left North Sydney, how did it roll from there for your career wise before, because you ultimately went into the Wallabies and you were part of the coaching squad under Rob McQueen, the won the 1999 World Cup and only gave up one try, which is remarkable. And you were defence coach along with Les Kiss, weren't you? I'm pretty sure he was there as well. No, no, Les never coached internationally for Australia. He coached the Waratahs uh, for four or five years, but no, he went to um, South Africa and Ireland, where, where where he did his uh, his coaching. No, he wasn't uh, he wasn't involved with the Wallabies at all in any of that time. So I was I was the only defence coach that you know that that was there. So you know. My time at North Sydney when when they uh, 
when they thought I'd had enough, they'd had enough of me and, and sent me on. And I went back to teaching for, for 18 months, but I was working for the Wallabies and uh, the Brumbies at the same time. And then leading up to the 99 World Cup, the Australian Rugby Union put me on full time um, to do the defence for, for basically all the teams from the women's through to the under under 20s, uh, under 21s, all the way through, you know, uh, the provinces to to the Wallabies. And at the time, the Wallabies and like Australian rugby, it was just hard nosed, in your face defences. It played a different style of rugby. It changed. I think it changed and revolutionised what they did in rugby and around the world. Like, watch the game. The Wallabies won the, the semi final against Ireland, one twenty seven twenty one. I think it was, was it Ireland or South Africa, and just grounded out all penalties and field goals. So yeah, no so, tries. No one gave anything. So. Yeah. It, it, look, that's a credit to the players that they were open to it. You know, they'd had uh, rugby league blokes come in before for. For guest coaching, you know, rather than be there for a long period of time and talk about bashing the opposition and that, and and we introduced a, a completely rugby defence right from the start. You know, there were some rugby league elements to it, but um, you know, it was definitely designed uh, for rugby and and a rugby rugby game uh, rather than just you know taking bits of rugby league and throwing it in there. And that, that was a credit to the players that they were open enough. And once they saw that we were serious and we were going to go right from the basis of, of footwork all the way through to tackle technique, all the way through to kick chase, um, you know, ruck defence and have structures for all of them that, that they could learn and, and get better at, um, you know, they all jumped at it, which was, you know, as I said, it, it's a credit to the players that they were open to it because, you know, they had been exposed before uh, for, for little success, more than, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, an instant sort of uh, G up, but, you know, no long-term benefit. Yeah. One interesting that the only team you gave it prior up to was actually the United States. So they... Uh, tend to like to play a bit of an expansive style and throw the ball around. So they've got nothing to lose. Either they're not expected to be a world superpower or do anything magnificent. So see how, I didn't watch the game where you beat them, but yeah, did look at the results the other day and I was surprised that we went through the whole tournament we've only given up one try. So the players can take a lot, a lot of a pat on the back in that, as well as yourself. Yeah, well, we, we have their side, so. It, it's pretty uh, pretty easy uh, catching good players. You know, we had we had blokes, and then we had four or five blokes, and that's not including Greed Gregan, uh, who was yet to captain Australia, who'd captain the Wallabies. So, experience wise, there, you know, we had not only good players, but we had uh, pretty pretty good blokes under pressure who'd captained uh, the country before and, and were experienced to do all that. As John Eels was the captain of that World Cup team, wasn't he? Yeah. That was his last World Cup. So, uh, did you have the uh, any? Who's probably the best player you come across that you worked with in the Wallaby setup? Because you would have come across different players all over the world. Who's the best you worked with you thought was responsible? You got the most out of a guy that got the most bang out of the buck for how good they were. Oh, look, I was there for 12 years, so, you know, I could tell you there was there was quite a few. You know, I don't like to pick individuals, but but one bloke I always thought was was really good for us was Ben Tune, um, both in attack and defence. You know, he uh, people talk about Lomu and, and how good an attacking players, a player he was, but when when Ben Tune was opposite him, you know, he... he he did do a really good job at, at keeping him quiet. So, um, you know, that that's, that really impressed me. And he would have been a great rugby league player. Yeah. So you see lots of people introduce, well, continue to go on defence here for a little bit. People play like all sorts of mixed defence styles up, up in your face, like an arrow style. So to have a lead defender and then two behind him, like an arrowhead, then up and slide, slide defence. You can't really introduce just one style all the time, can you? You kind of have to be multifaceted to get like a good defensive system working. 
Yeah, look, I know that in North Sydney we used to, in there, 20, we'd, uh, we'd definitely um, be up and in, you know, particularly if we had them on a sideline in the middle of the field, we'd be on a one-pass drift, so you go up and if if they pass it and they've got overs, you, you know, you, you shift one and, and keep going and, and then, um, you know, about... 40 metres out, you know, you might be a little bit softer depending on what tackle it was. Um, and then back on your goal line, you know, the, you can't, you haven't got space to drift or whatever. So you, you got to aim up and and square up and get off the line. So, Jen, can you? Oh, Sorry, um, oh, that's all right. So from there, you went and coached in Europe for a little while too, if that's correct. Yeah, I've. You know, yeah, there's uh, over the last 20 years, I've probably spent uh, since 2008. Uh, I haven't spent a, as much time in this Australia as as I as as I'd like to. I've been to Wales, England, um, Georgia, uh, Japan, uh, all all on coaching uh, contracts. So it's uh, it's been. It's been nice, um, but, you know, there's no place like home and being away from the family, obviously, for long periods of time is, is not ideal. Yeah. So um, what would you say that like, everywhere, every country's got their own different style and techniques. Now, see a lot of the European sides, particularly the second or third tier nations, they have big forwards. They like to play tough up through the cuts and that sort of stuff, and they probably lack a bit of finesse. Maybe in the, some of the professional approach, fitness, and just don't have depth really for players like Wallabies and all black to be competitive. Um, what, like, what do you try to introduce? Because you would have taken bits and pieces out of everything you do. Now you're at Bemmerf. What do you try to take into coaching? Because you've got a very different dynamic and they're not full on professional players and everything like that. I yeah. it's it's very very much coaching what's in front of you. You know, the the language, whether, you know, it's a second language, uh, English is a second language, my language, you know, when I went to Georgia, I had to learn, you know, some terms in Georgian, uh, which did help me in Japan because I taught myself all those uh, before I went to Japan. So I, well, I got on, you know, I was... I got off the plane, you know, straight into it rather than having to acclimatise for a while. Uh, but people in different situations learn differently as well. Um, so how you coach, um, whether you use more visual, whether you walk them through it on the field, um, that, that changes depending on, you know, the level that you've got and uh, and, and the way they learn. And, and traditionally, um, you know, different cultures learn differently. So it's uh, – and, and a much – like the Japanese are very diligent with their – with their learning and, and their work. Um, so it's 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 good to set them tasks that they can go away and you'll know that they'll go away and do them. Whereas um, in some other some other places, uh, you know, that mightn't get done. Yeah. Well, I had the experience of playing against Japan's Touring World Cup squad in 2003. They just come out and played in like a bit of an invitational West W's team. And we played against their cold combined World Cup squad. They probably had about seven or eight first 15 guys playing, plus guys they were looking at for the 2003 World Cup and all this stuff. But this is a piece of piss. We're going to walk over these guys. Went out there with the attitude and they sp they spanked us 43 nil. we just do things, take the ball in, one out, and they'd have two blokes straight over the top of you and go, what's going on here? Before you've even put the ball out there or stripped it and gone about four wide and you're watching a prop run up the sideline outside your wing and just going, oh, this is not good. So... That their professionalism was like next level, really, the attitude and application to the task compared to like, and there are a few of our guys that are playing in the Western Sydney Subways side, walking around, having a beer before the game, having cigarettes at half time. I think I might have been eating a pie at half time while I was having a beer as well. So didn't really engage into it as good as, as, good as we probably should have, but it was all a good experience to play against them. So do you think that, um, that that rugby culture is a really fundamental part of rugby that like others 
just don't have you. I haven't seen it. I haven't been as exposed to rugby league as you have. Do you think that's something that uh, really makes rugby unique and that we'll really need to capture and bring out? Oh, look, I, I think rugby league's, you know, um, changed. The, the tribal element of it um, isn't as great as it used to be, I don't think, except in a few different uh, circumstances, whereas in Shoot Shield, um, one of the things that that we've got to be careful careful of is is not losing uh, traditional rivalries, you know. So um, I know we'll talk about it later, but you know, if if those seven clubs exclude Warringah um, from anything that they that they're planning, and you lose the Warringah versus Manly, the Northern Beaches uh, um, head to head or local derby. Um, you know, what a tragedy that'll be for those two clubs. So there are certain aspects of, of our game and, and, you know, even as silly things like a little boat race between first graders, you know, having a beer after the game together and, and a little, spend a little bit more time together is, is, um, is very important to the fabric of the game and also the, the different sizes that uh, that you have, you know, rugby league players, are, as you said, are, are levelling out to a certain shape and size, a common shape and size, with with a few exceptions. Whereas rugby is a game for all shapes and all sizes, you know, um, and that's something that that both of them have got to got to protect. Yeah, that's right. So, and you you'd be more aware than most. So, Pema, the players that you get. Exposed to they come in many shapes and sizes, so ranging from big, like I'm 6'5, 155 kilos, whatever. And you get players like that, guys coming to look at like first grade, they're, they're big guys down to like five, six, 75 kilos. Stuff. So it must be hard making bits and pieces at Emmerich. Um, I've played lower grades there for several years, and as I always saw it's very difficult. To and compete with the clubs that have got 100 players compared to what we might make in the side up on the day of the game. So, uh, yeah, that, that still continues. And and part of that's socioeconomic as well, because, you know, if the boss rings up and says, I need you to work today on Saturday morning, you know, they have to go. It's their job and they can't afford to lose their job. Uh, you know, they're not on contracts um, as, as, you know, the the sign on big sign on fee and you know assured money. They've got to play to get the money, but they have to work as well. So you know that's a realistic part of of what it is out west, and and, and I don't think that that people understand that sometimes we're standing there and we're counting blokes as they come in, um, or we're calling up blokes to come in who weren't going to play because a bloke's been rung by his boss in the morning and saying, no, nah, mate, I need you to come in and work. And, and they don't get a choice because of, of where they are, you know. And and the communities out west, you know, some of them are, are, are some parts of our community have, have done it really tough in, in COVID and, and lost jobs originally and, and have now got part-time jobs and, and struggling to make, make, uh, make ends meet. So... You know, we've got to be aware of that and we've got to understand that, but I don't think people who aren't um, open to understand what goes out or what goes on uh, this side of the, the Harbour Bridge or the, this side of the, the Piermont Bridge, um, I don't think they care. And, and that's, that's the tragedy of the whole thing. They just see the end product and, uh, you know, they don't, they don't care about what people are going through out here. Yeah. So... Back in the 60s and that in rugby league, and I think there's a Balmain, Dennis Tuddy, I think it was, broke the mould of this. Dennis Tuddy left Balmain, he signed for Pemmerich, and he didn't live in Pemmerich. And he was, I think he was one of the first players to get contracted like this. Uh, but the rule used to be you used to have to play in your district. Uh, how do you think some of the shoot shield sides would fare now if they had to attract players from, let's say, the Eastern Suburbs District, Rose Bay, Bayern Osor, Ferris, Ramwick, around the Cookie? that sort of area and yeah if people had to draw from their ge their geographical area would that affect the comp right now as we saw 
would it look different? Oh, definitely. You know, particularly when you're talking about front rowers hookers, you know, the, the size of, of those blokes, you know. Culturally, the Islanders make up a large percentage of, of those blokes and, you know, South Africans as well. Um, and because you've got a range from a halfback all the way through, you know, he might be five foot five, five foot six, five foot seven, five foot eight, up to a six foot four bloke. And he might have blokes running around at 75 Ks and blokes running around at 125 Ks. Um, it's very difficult for every, every postcode to, to be across that that sort of demographic. So, you know, yeah, if 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 you just had to, to look after your own juniors and and what was from there, well, we wouldn't be that bad because we've got, you know, we we've got uh, we've got the cultural diversity out west. Um, you know, uh, but there, there would be some people who'd uh, who'd be struggling. And you know, without without us in the competition, obviously um those people who we've got out here who are playing for us uh, would be available to somebody else yeah as you said just uh before like the socioeconomic factor definitely affects it so to to be fair income about it the north shore and eastern suburb sides probably more than not they've got a higher majority of white collar people playing where if they got injured in their in rugby like let's say someone broke a leg you could probably still turn up the work and do an office job more than not in most of your roles they do, whereas most of the players are probably play at Pemmerf at the moment. And it was uh, true to the day when I was still playing, they were blue collar workers. So if they got injured, they didn't work, they didn't make money. That always affected their decision about if they were going to play, if they weren't going to play, they had to provide for their family. Everyone has to provide for their families, but it's a completely different world when you're in a different economic condition and you're in a different role like as opposed to white collar or teacher uh, opposed yeah. to like a laborer yeah i, I think you you got to you've you've thrown a too broad a um net over all that because the, the blokes that we lost last year who were playing for warringah this year um you know their their main job is is a labor and they're, they're traveling there you know, because they're getting a little bit of extra cash in the hand, you know. And and some of the problems we have, uh, you know, blokes are getting $100 cash to play for a, for a pub side out here and, you know, and rather than play rugby. And, you know, it's it's less training, less less on their, their family side and it's, it's money in their pocket, so... You know, you can't you can't throw a broad and say they don't have any labourers. You know, a lot of a lot of the their blokes are, but um, you know, it's just uh, there's they've got a wider cross section of of players and, and what they're going through, whereas ours is is definitely narrower. Yeah, do you think more could be done for profession, uh, professional development of players? Like I know some of the Sydney clubs, like Sydney Uni, have the if they talented people have gone to the uni and they like rugby, or they give them opportunity to play football, and they've got the pathway there to help these people develop a professional career in other fields and stuff. And I haven't been aware of anything like that happening at Pemmerf. Um, it, it would be great to see, but do um, you think that would make a difference at all to the player stock numbers that you have in the club? Look, yeah. Look, Sydney Uni's not going to let anyone go to Sydney Uni who's who's not up to it. So, for a start, the, the people that they're offering scholarships to have obviously got some scholastic ability. So they're not just offering scholarships to anyone. So that would be unfair on Sydney Uni to say that they're offering scholarships to people who, because Sydney Uni wouldn't do that. Their reputation is a is a top top flight the university you'd go out the window if if you know they their average as go down so that, yeah. that doesn't happen you know and and but we have been approaching uh western sydney university and and everybody you know from the western sydney wanderers etc you know 
the cricket clubs out here have been approaching them as well. And then they're reluctant to get into that for the same sort of reason. Um, you know, they'd, they'd rather have a funded scholarship where somebody who is either one um, in a sort of semi-refugee status would never get the opportunity or two um, is, is, is good enough to go there you know, on their own merits, but but can't do it financially, um, he, he would do it. So, you know, it, it, to be to be consistent with those, you got to you got to get you got to keep those young blokes who are going there because they want to go to university. They're going to go to university. They've they've already got that as part of their you know makeup, and and they're scholastically ready to go. Um, you know, you've we, we've got to tap into that to try and keep them out here, and 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 whether that's a fund or whether it's uh, any rugby organisation that already exists, like the Rugby Forum Foundation, can do something with regard to to funding, um, you know, part of or you know all of a, a couple of scholarships at Western Sydney University that might keep a couple of blokes here, but we've we've already from our from our junior reps, you know, we're losing kids to 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 um, GPS and CAS schools on scholarships. Yeah. You know, and, and I know that you know I'm pretty sure um, that that that's against. You know, in some cases, it's it's not really kosher as far as the, the rules of GPS etc. Are, are concerned. But you know, they're getting scholarships for for rugby, so. You know, what, what can you do there? Well, you know, we don't have that many schools out west uh, that play rugby union. You know, it's a, it's a rugby league stronghold all the way through the schools. They might play and we might have a couple of sports schools out west, but, but the general schools um, play rugby league. Yeah, so, and AFL's got a strong football now and quite a big bank balance to take on anybody who wants to flex their arm a bit today. They're starting to have voices they never had before, and they're getting all sorts of range of uh, Islander people looking at AFL that they might never have thought of before. And as you go to the school, like 300 football, they take them out there, and a couple of decent AFL players and development officers. And next thing you know, the school involved in AFL. So, and it only grows from that because you know, AFL gives it a bit of water and love that maybe might not be getting seen these days through lack of development officers in the West, so from rugby union. Well, if you talk to any PE teacher in the AFL, come knocking on the door and they'll say, oh, we'll help you out on Thursdays, would you like us to run AFL? Um, they bring all the equipment, they bring all the coaches. You only have to allocate a teacher to, to be the representative from the school and the AFL do it all. You know, so that's that's what no development officers in the West, as far as rugby is concerned, uh, combats against. You know, so so where where uh, where are you going to get the the return from that? You're going to get it through kids playing more more kids playing Aussie rules. Yeah. So what do you think will happen if um, New South Wales Rugby or Rugby Australia don't do something proactive to help stimulate rugby in the West and help clubs that are out here like Premier? Two Blues, West Harbour, like the suburbs, Bob seem to be doing pretty well. I've been involved with Blue Mountains and they're doing well. Hawkesbury Valley, I've played there before and they're really kicking on again this year after having a bit of a lull. How, how do we bridge that? How do we get players to want to advance their career from amateur rugby, park rugby to higher levels? And what do you do? Well, you, you, you got to target what you want to do. You know, if, if you look at Penrith's uh, sort of thing, the other day that Penrith's got the largest uh, Aboriginal um, Indigenous population in Australia. That's higher than than Alice Springs and places like that. Um, how many Aboriginal kids have we got playing for the Waratahs or playing for, you know, we're, we're, I don't have one. So we're missing out on that whole demographic out there. And, and they're wonderful footballers. So, you know, what Kirtley did... Um, and none of them are playing rugby. So so the, the people who are supposed to be developing the game, they've missed that whole demographic there of wonderfully, wonderfully talented rugby players. 
Yeah. So you got to target what you're going to do, and then you you got to go out and you got to get them. Like, so I don't think they know where to start. So I, and I don't know where to start. So I'm I'm no expert on it. Um, but there there are plenty of kids out there with plenty of talent, and at the moment, majority of them are going to rugby league. Yeah, like you said, it doesn't help that you can play park rugby league. You can even play second division, third division to get paid 100 bucks, 150 bucks to play a game. And there you go, you play with your mates, turn up to train them once a week if that, have a couple of beers, have a couple of soft sandwiches after the game. It's not too taxing. You're not really going to get too busted. You can still go to work, work on Saturday if you need to. So rugby has a lot of unique challenges considering factors that there are up and around now. Um, but but the, the the subby teams out west are all full. Yeah. I've got plenty of plenty of grades. It, it's just the, the barrier between getting to that next stage and and Penrith getting to a stage where they're competitive, um, consistently competitive. So those kids when they come up have got the choice of going to subbies or, or being aspirational to 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 make the Waratahs say, okay, I'll, I'll go and give Penrith a, a couple of years. And, and that's the support for the couple of years that we need to get Penrith to that stage where kids coming out of school or whatever want to play in their local postcode and and, and Penrith can survive for that long. But the, 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 they got kicked out of the competition a couple of years ago. Now the rumours are we're you know, not going to be in it again because we're not going to make this... Um, so the, the continual lack of security that the club has damages the club every year. And they, they told us late last year we're going to be in it again as late as possible. Um, and, and we missed the boat on a few things. But the, the, constant, the constant doubt about whether the club is going to exist and whether it's going to survive and that the people are going to, are trying to get rid of it does more damage than anything else. The uncertainty. You know, why would you go to Penrith when you don't know that Penrith is going, to, is going to be in it for the next three or four years? Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's where yeah. the damage is being made. It, it, forget about anything else. Um, the fact that there is always, and that they were kicked out of the comp um, after 2016, that, uh, 2017, sorry, that, 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 that insecurity is what's killing rugby in, at, at Penrith and the, the shoot shield, the ability for those kids to come through. Because if you've got the choice of going to Blacktown, that's a strong club, got plenty of grades, great women's team, great juniors. We've got a great junior set up now that, that has been put together. You know, Adam Fletcher started it a, a couple of years ago and he deserves all the credit in the world. Um, but those kids... Uh, they've got no security yeah. to stay at Penn. So if somebody comes along and knocks on their door, they're going to leave because there is no security. So once we can get, you know, put, stop people trying to kill us off and trying to help us, and it's no good if New South Wales does anything because New South Wales don't run our comp. Sydney yeah. rugby runs. So New South Wales and Australian rugby can can say whatever they want, but the ones who are trying are, are, are the Sydney Rugby Union clubs. So that's 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 the the problem. So you got to turn them around first, the management at Sydney Rugby Union, before before you you even worry about New South Wales and and the Australian Rugby Union, because if they kick us out, there's no way for us to play. Yeah. So New South Wales can come out with five million dollars, but if there's no way for us to play, what's the point? Yeah. So, and the criteria this year was supposed to be three and two, unless you're in a rebuilding development stage, which Pembroke are. And now they want to change the goalpost with no notice and the shortest period of time to four and three. Is, is that unrealistic for, for like all of the clubs in the West, not just Pembroke, but the two Blues and West Harbour as well? 
Well, oh, West Harbour came out and said that they'll get the 550, 550,000 and they'll have all those teams and they'll have a women's team. Here. I doubt it, but if that's what they say, that's what they say. Um, but I, I can't see with the number of teams they've got this year and the trouble they've got with Colts this year, how they're going to be able to do that. We've, we've got two Colts teams, but, um, you know, our kids are, are more in the 17, 18-year-old group rather than the 19, 20-year-old group. But we do have two full, you know, um, two Colts, although we've, we've had to, to drop um, the last two weeks because... 12 of our first grade cults have been called into the Sydney um, Sydney schools trials for, for you know the part the schools pathway up to Australian school board um, so that's that's killed off our first grade you know because yeah. they're putting them in camp for two weekends in the middle of the shoot shield season which is just absolutely ridiculous so so but when everything's normal we do have those. We chose not to field a second grade because um, to field a second grade, that compromised. Um, we don't have enough for a bench for first grade, a, a fresh bench for first grade and a fresh bench for second grade and a first grade and second grade team. You need, you know, probably close right. to 60 with injuries to do that. And, and we're running the, you know, mid 30s to high 30s, which is, which is, which is, you know, workable for a first grade. And, and the whole aim that I put to the club was that it's easier then next year to keep these blokes together and then add to get that second grade next year. But we're not going to get four grades. Yeah. You're talking about another 120 players easily. Another 120, but they're just, I don't think they're there. To be honest with you, I tried to help Chris numbers earlier in the year and the best I could do is find like maybe 26 guys that were available that maybe could fill fourth grade and third grade for you. You might pick a couple of them out of that if they were available. Maybe come into like bench stuff in first grade. They, I don't think the guys were at first grade standard anymore. Some of them played before they were older. Yeah, no. That just is a challenge on its own. Semi-professional yeah, look, level nearly. So yeah, is, yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's they're just not the players out there. Yeah. Is there some way, like from a rugby league perspective, is there a way when Scott Johnson coached the parent, I think it's 1999 and 2000, they had the best season ever and they just missed the finals. I think they had Peter Fenton there as well. But they managed to get Glenn Lydiard. Glenn Lydiard brought across other blokes that had been at or around first grade or reserve grade quality rugby league players. And they tend and managed to pick up like 10, 10 blokes. Plus, they had blokes like Daryl Beef, the good quality prop. People had done the job, been there before. There's everything come together then. Is that an avenue worth looking at? Trying to see Pemriff have got guys in their system, rugby league, that and perhaps not up to NRL standard, but like a very good level that might want to have an opportunity to try to play professional football. And well, we then... had them last. We had them last year when they didn't play, and we also had uh, um, some Fijian boys who were, you know, connected to to country clubs because the country, you know, the those competitions didn't go ahead. But but those competitions are going ahead now. You know, if you look at St Mary's, uh, I think. As of last week, they were undefeated as and their Ron Massey team. That's Penrith's basically reserve grade. Um, you know, they that's they run that. They run that as a professional, and and they pay good money, and they've got players on on contract there. So that's that doesn't happen anymore. Like you know, those that flow of players. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll play for St Mary's or for Marylands or, you know, all those leagues clubs. Wenty uh, is connected to Parramatta. Um, so you've got all those leagues clubs and, and they're not going to... It's the same payment issue, you know. That, you know, you can get a contract there and you can get paid. And, and it makes a big difference to a guy who might only be making 700 to 1000 bucks in the hand a week taking home for his um, wife and two or three kids or whatever. It's, it's just a tough living. So, and the money matters to get money out of playing football. 
or it's rugby league, you're playing marbles for money, or you're playing rugby union for Pemaphemia, so that that they need some compensation for their time. And that, that, it... that, you're talking about a different world, also. You know, the, to, the around the turn of the the millennium, around two thousand. Uh, people, blokes at Penrith weren't getting paid, like you know, and you know, it, it, so rugby league blokes were getting paid, but but rugby union blokes at, at shoot shield level, very very few were getting paid. So they were doing it because they loved the opportunity, and you know, they 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 liked it. And Peter Besling was an employee. You know, I think there were two employees of New South Wales Rugby as development officers who who Scott took with him to. To play at um, Penrith as well, and they certainly made a huge difference with their with their presence on the field. Yeah, COVID obviously hurt you a lot last year because the feedback I was getting from around the local media didn't directly hear it from the club, but it's getting whisperings here. We're on the verge of maybe picking up work with Palu and a couple of people linked to him, perhaps Dave Dennis, and they were both overseas at the time. COVID come along and buried that idea pretty much. So. That, that's off the table now, isn't it? That yeah. might happen. If neither of those blokes were, were ever going to play for Penrith last year. Yeah. Uh, they, they both had contracts overseas. So, you know, that, but what they were going to do was was going to act as ambassadors. Well, no, Dave Dennis never heard from him. So, you know, he says a lot in the media, but I've never never heard from him. Um, but Cliff, Cliff Parley was a, a, a terrific with... Uh, with advice and being a contact for for some of the blokes who who wanted to be there, he's very supportive of of it. And you know, it, it's been a because I was at the same Japanese club as him um, only two years ago. So you know, he he's always been keen to to help out as much as he can. But he's getting into coaching now in in Japan. So you know, he's he's not on the he's not on the horizon either. Now, as a level four coach, what did you have to do to become a level four coach? Level three is an invitation by um, New South Wales Rugby, isn't it, to go up to that? And then how do you go about going up to a level four? Well, oh, just it's, um, you know, it, it just was part of the what I had to do when when I was with the Wallabies. It included, you know, mentoring other other coaches, lecturing at those those um, level three coaching um, coaching courses. Um, also, it involves aspirational, you know, professional development as well. So coaching overseas obviously helps with that, but it's basically by, by invitation. They come and find you rather than, than the other way around. You know, it's, it's, it's to help people go to that next stage and get involved in professional um, in professional rugby and help them work out what they need to be, you know, professional rugby coaches. So, I, you know, basically an extension of, of level three um, with, with more experience, et cetera, thrown in. I remember back in the day when you had brown hair, did you start going grey around about the same time you started the coach? Uh, yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's that's exactly what it is, and it's it's getting greyer by the day. <laughs> so, in an ideal world, someone walked up to you and said, "All right, Premier's going to be in shoot shield for the next ten years." What, what would you like to say? Oh, we can give you anything you want. It's going to help you out with Premier. What, what would you need? What do you need? What would you like to ask for and help with assistance? Obviously, you'd like to have a constant stream of uh, ready and able players to come in that are equipped to play that level of football would be a good starting point. Well, the first thing would be the security. Um, the second thing would be um, to turn some of the, the schools in the area around to rugby rather than rugby league, um, whether that be you know, some Blue Mountain schools or, or schools, you know, close by, um, but definitely have um, a schoolboy present um, and, and probably need five, four or five schools to do that. And that includes girls' teams as well, you know, because the, the future, 
the, the future for women in rugby is is good, uh, if not better than than boys in rugby at the moment. Yeah. So <laughs> that that's a, that's one of the the great positives of the, the last five years. Um, facilities as well, yeah. and 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 just the we need a general manager, somebody to to go out and get the funds. Do the do the day to day organisation of the place because, you know, at the moment we've got a great group of volunteers doing it, but you know, the, every once in a while something falls through the cracks and and you can't afford that in this game, and sometimes one of the things or a couple of the things that fell through cracks last year were we were contracting players that that um, we should have got got done before the end of the year but you know once again if you, you can't sign people if you don't have the security yeah so you helped lead the team that had first went in about seven and a little bit years um this year and it was a watershed moment really like i, I get tired of seeing the media the local media around here they do a bit to promote the emus but it's been a bit of a laughing joke oh the emus get smashed and it's just you don't get favourable attention from the media outside of Pemera. Pemera Femus, it's a bit of a joke. Um, that wouldn't do anything to help your aspirations to try and attract those evil, would it? Um, no, it was good. It was good. And, and we've had some blokes just turn up in the, the last couple of weeks um, to, to try the place out. Um, so, you know, that that did for a while have a, have a positive Influence, but we let ourselves down two weeks later, you know, with a bad loss um, on the road up in, up in Newcastle. But we've hit back since then. You know, we played pretty good for half a game on, on the weekend. We, we just didn't control the first half and what we wanted to do very well. But we finished the game strong and won the second half against Eastern Suburbs. There were no slouches. Um, we just got to make sure that you know, we, we keep the fight going we can't have big scores scored against us we we really need to to finish strong and and we've got to play newcastle uh, newcastle again um we play west harbour we've got to play Parramatta again which is good um so we've got to finish strong and and we've we've got a if we get a second win we're really desperate for that to to make sure that you know that that comes again you know we'll get the same wave of of publicity and positive feedback if if we win another one so um that's that's in our in our aim is to to certainly win another one or two or you know if if possible three games before the end of the season and be competitive as as much as we can yeah i got the pleasure of commentating one of your games for last season against Waringa clutch tv down at on the pm rugby park and in in the lower grades didn't do quite as well. Did a right in second grade. They were very close and lost by what eight or ten points, whatever. And in first grade, you, the end scoring up and lost forty eight to seventeen or something. But you got five or six tries in probably about a ten minute period. And if that hadn't happened, like in just before half time, I think you're right in that game against Warringah, and it would have been a whole different score line. They wouldn't have been. They got the stage of showboating a little bit once they got away with it. And you could just see that mm, boys are down a bit at half time. It's hard to get them back up. They're giving them a mental edge um, out and chase it down. But they did. I think he's outscored Warringah in the second half as well. So it must be difficult knowing that, gee, we're close, except for about 10 minutes there. And we dropped the ball and now we've got smoke. So. Yeah, that's that's part of fitness, but it's part of mental, mental and physical fitness, which we we continue to work at, and it's probably been the greatest thing that's held Penrith back is you know the fact that they haven't been able to finish games off. They've been in good position, but haven't been able to finish good games off. And whereas Parramatta, you know, they had, we had the opportunity to lose that game, but we grabbed it and, and got back up there end of the field and got a penalty and. You know, basically held that field position for the last, you know, um, three or four minutes, and uh, put away the win. Whereas in previous times we probably would have done something stupid, thrown an intercept or something like that. So 
yeah. you know, uh, we know what we've got to work on and we are working on it, but um, it, it's, it doesn't come overnight. You've got some very good quality players at the moment too on the squad. You've got Jackson Clark, he played Taranaki when the juniors come through there. And he, he looks pretty good. He's got the goods about him, Joe Maher. And I don't like singling out people either, but he's got, he's got some very good players coming through. Andrew's the new captain. And um, you, you must be pretty happy with the base of what you got, but it'd be frustrating that you can get close and you can take a game up to East and be in it, but not quite get there in the end. That, that like a painstaking thing for you or is that like a sign like the developments coming on along the game? Um, yeah, well, the thing about last week is we did everything in the first half that we knew that we wanted to do to them. So we put ourselves under pressure instead of putting them under pressure. We coughed up field position and didn't kick well when we knew that. And, and they we, we succumbed to the pressure and put them in positions where they could score those four tries. Um, whereas in the second half... Um, we controlled field position and and put them under pressure and they started making silly mistakes. You know, they played the second half pretty well as we played the first half um, and we played the second half pretty well as they played the first half. So that was positive. Um, but we've got to be able to go out and do that right from the start. We've got to believe that we can do it. And 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 that's a, that's a big thing in rugby is belief. And, and that's why Jack Gibson was a good coach because he instilled belief into you. And you were too scared that what he was going to do if you <laughs> played. Uh, I'll get the feeling some of the guys might be a bit scared of you because you're not backwards in coming forwards about telling people who've been in a couple of meetings and that this year, which were, they were needed to be done. It needed, everyone needed to hear where the club was at and what had to happen. And they have all the rumours and innuendo, you better off just putting it out there up front, getting it out on the table. So your guys... Are they all buying into it all together? Everything? Yeah, look, in, in general terms, yeah. They have their ups and downs. You know, the, the things about the Kiwis that we brought over is is they've joined the cycle. You know, we had to get them jobs. They're not getting magnificent money. They're over here for opportunity and to be seen and 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 to, to start their careers. But they've also got jobs as well and, you know, and... and there's one or two of them we got really good jobs for and, and uh, you know, they start at five, five o'clock, get up at five <laughs> o'clock in the morning to start at six. So, you know, sometimes they're a bit dodgy when they when they get there at 6.30 to start training that night. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to keep them up all the time. Um, but, you know, we've got, a, we've got this long weekend coming up, so I'm going to give them a week off to, to recharge their batteries. We'll give them... Um, you know, some stuff to do, and we ex expect to see him twice in the gym during the week to do uh, conditioning with uh, down at Fit for All, which is our gym um, down at Penrith there that uh, Milton Milton runs and and does a really good job with the boys. So uh, you know, we'll get them in for some fitness during the week as well. But um, mentally, we'll we'll try and give them a break, and from that work training cycle, you know that. That they can get into, and hopefully that'll freshen them up for the, for the, for the, you know, the second part of the season. Yeah. Have you got another buy in the competition, or just have one, and then the second one dropped on the long weekend? We got the weekend, the long weekend, and then we've got a buy a month later. Yeah. So they've got one win so far. Not sitting in last place. Things I think things have improved from my involvement with the club and from what I've seen, and. Uh, you're getting better, but you've got a long way to go before you can say, oh, yeah, this is successful. Um, what, what's the aim for you for the rest of the season? Well, just what, what I've said, you know, get a couple more wins, um, be competitive, uh, improve our game and the consistency of our game. If we can improve our game and the consistency of it, particularly our kicking game and, and field position, then we'll get those two wins, two or three wins. Yeah. Um, what does the future hold for Muggleton? Yeah. Lots of golf and retirement. <laughs> How do you go golf? Dab hand to golf? Uh, not at the moment, but <laughs> I used to be. 
I used to be all right, then I'm living. It's like my footy. I'm living on past glory. That's all right. You've got a footy card? you got a, got a few. Yeah. A few yeah. old ones. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any of your own footy cards or anything like that. So that's one thing I always said when I was young. Always wanted to get to the top level and get my own footy cards and massive failure. So never did it. So um, thanks for your time today, John. I really appreciate it. I apologise for the earlier stuff ups that uh, come around, but um, yeah, it's been enlightening to have a chat to you and uh, been really forthcoming about information and things we can do to work on rugby, particularly in Pembroke, uh, being used in the Western suburbs. And yeah, wish you the best of luck and I will uh, see you around over the next couple of weeks for sure, down at training and just chit-chatting stuff to people. All right. Uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, any of your listeners want to get down to, to support the club, Emu Burger is the best burger in, in Sydney. So uh, make sure you get one of those when you come down. Yeah, you won't, you won't be missing out on anything. They are very good. So ask for everything. Ask for the works. You'll be very happy. Yeah. So thanks for your time, right, John. Mate. I'll catch up. Okay. See, See you later. Bye. bye.